If there's been one unexpected bright spot to the start of Miami season, it's rookie sensation Jaime Hawkins Jr., who continues to electrify Heat fans with his energy and toughness. There's no denying he's been great, but can he be in the conversation for the Rookie of the Year award? And does his impact change Miami's ceiling, not just this year, but beyond? We take a deep dive on Juan Wick on today's episode of Locked on Heat. You are locked on Heat, your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome to Locked On Heat, your daily podcast on the Miami Heat. I'm Wes Goldberg. Joining me as always, David Ramil. However, you're tuning in on YouTube, Odyssey, your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase. A big episode talking about Jaime Hakas Jr. today. Let's start here. J.J. Redick said on his podcast that, quote, Jaime Hakas Jr. outside of Chet Holmgren and Victor Webinyama has been the best rookie this year. Then went on to talk about his emergence as a key player uh, and how that changes the way he thinks about the Heat's ceiling this season. I want to talk about exactly that, how this impacts Miami ceiling their championship chances. Jaime's opportunity to win Rookie of the Year, potentially. We're going to get to all that on today's show, but let's start with the sound from J.J. Reddick's The Old Man in the Three podcast. And Jaime Jaquez Jr., outside of Chet Holmgren and Wembenyama, has been the best rookie to me in the NBA this year. And, you know, not a hyped prospect. Four-year guy out of UCLA. uh, Not a lottery pick the Miami Heat found sort of the perfect fit in Jaime Jaquez Jr. You know, he can pass, he can move, he can play off the dribble, he can post. There's just so many facets to his game. And I, I just, I, I've been blown away at at that pick, at that spot for the Miami Heat. And finding someone uh, who I think changes now how I view the Miami Heat in terms of their chance to win a championship this year so a couple of directions that we can go in with that, uh, David. I do want to get to the Heat's ceiling part of this, the fact that the national media uh, is starting to take notice of Jaime Jaquez. But what do you, we think about Jaime being the third best rookie behind Wemby and Chet? I think it's certainly a possibility. I, I feel like so much of the awards and and the kind of build up to the announcement of who wins these awards has to do with a term that's been kind of overused, which is the narrative, right? It has to be some kind of a story involved here. Webin Yama, like no no rookie could live up to that hype because he was so, you know, touted as one of the best prospects in NBA history. And, right. you know, he has been very solid to start off his NBA career. There's no denying that he's been effective in spots, but the Spurs are also not winning very much. And there's some time for him to develop and, I, I think that might change the perspective on, on who he is, but I think there's still so much belief in what kind of a player he could be, the prospect that he is certainly, you know, seems to be, that I think he's probably still clearly in the lead. Chet similarly had a lot of hype last year, was injured for his rookie season, and now is of course a second year player, but still technically a rookie because he didn't get a chance to play at all last year for Oklahoma City. I think he's been very, very good. And the Oklahoma City Thunder have been very good. And yeah. when you look at the difference between last year's team and this year's team, really, it's it's mostly his emergence. Everybody else has gone incrementally better as well. It's a good, deep, fun, young team mm-hmm. with some real chances at making some noise in the playoffs. So I think the fact that he's a part of that certainly has a lot of, a lot of people to what he can do as a tall player. Again, like kind of a – not necessarily a foil, but we love doing this thing as media members and as fans. Like – rookie versus rookie right and you kind of watch them throughout the rest of their careers it started with a bird and magic right yeah and, you know kind of Shaq and alonzo to lebron degrees. and carmelo and then Dwayne wade yeah. got in that conversation yeah. yeah yeah so we always do this so now it's like it's web and yama versus chet as yeah. the, the dual hyped you know kind of uh pairing there but the fact that jaime has been able to make the kind of impact that he has I, i'm a, i'm very very surprised and I, I think reddick being a former player and a, a committed basketball junkie who watches so much basketball, not just as a media member, but just because he loves the sport and right. spends a lot of time obsessing over it. I mean, if you listen to his show, it's pretty clear that he does. 
the fact that he's watched the heat enough to recognize this kind of impact is remarkable. And I just love the fact that we're starting to get this, this narrative out there about what he can do. I don't know if anybody, I don't, I've said this before, the national perspective of Miami is pretty limited. It's like, again, cause they don't do much during the reg- regular season to kind of stand out and take notice. It's all about what Jimmy Butler does yeah. during the playoffs that I think really gains that peripheral opinion of a, a bills that peripheral opinion about what Miami can, can't do in terms of their title contention during the regular season. I mean, we, we watch this team 82 times a year and it's like their offense is stale. They're, they're, they're a boring to watch. To watch it. They're boring to watch. Yeah. And that's okay to say it. Unless you're a heat fan, that's not a fun team to watch. And that's okay. The heat prefer yeah. it that way. So the fact that, you know, again, with Bam's defensive player of the year candidacy with, with what Jimmy does during the regular season, what, what, yeah. you know, the small role players do, that kind of gets overlooked until the lights become brighter and they're, yeah. they're on the bigger stage. And then everybody goes, hey, this team's not so bad. Or, you know, and then all of a sudden you kind of start to see it. So I, I love that he's putting the name out there. I think he's certainly in consideration. I, I think I don't want to talk about the rookie of the year stuff specifically. I'm just talking about well, we'll get to that later in the show. Just in terms of what you've seen, because you watch a lot of basketball too, right? You and I both yeah. watch the lot. We, we both host the Locked on NBA show once a week. Our job is not just to cover the Miami Heat, we cover the whole league. I think Chet has been the best rookie so far this too. year. I don't think yeah. I don't even think it's particularly close. I think Wemby, what he does defensively, is almost immeasurable. I think that I think Victor Webinyama is right out of the box a one of the best defensive centers in the league, and it's pretty remarkable. Offensively, it's still a little raw, but I would probably still put him second behind Chet in terms of what he's been able to contribute on the court, despite the fact that the Spurs literally can't figure out how to win a game. All right. I, I think Jaime, just in terms of not a rookie of the year thing, just in terms of what we believe in terms of who the best rookies are. I would put Jaime right there, probably with Asar Thompson, and I would probably give Jaime the edge because he's doing it with it, – it's not that he doesn't have room to do stuff. Like, Spolster keeps adding stuff no. to his plate, and I think right. that's that, that says a lot about their belief in Jaime Jaquez, but I think because he's doing that on a roster with Jimmy Butler, with Bam yes. Adebayo, with T- Tyler Hero yes. for the first part of the season all this stuff, that he's still grabbing more stuff and adding more responsibility to his job what did description. He say? What is supposed to say yesterday? Like we keep giving him more, and he just gobbles it up, right? Wasn't that his, the exact phrase that he used? And it's just interesting. I, you're, it's a great point because with Asar, like it's not a knock on him. He's a fun player to watch, and defensively, he does a lot of nice things. And he has defensively, some, he's even to beyond him. what Jaime does defend. I mean, he, he's no going to be an All NBA defender probably next year. Yes, yeah, he is. He, he does look like the Herb Jones kind of model, right, but he's yeah. really maybe even a little bit more athletic. But at the same time, like. It's it's kind of I hate to, looter and a riot kind of thing, right? Because they're not winning a lot. They're trying maybe, and then they kind of give up. And it's like, well, somebody's got to do Jayden something. Jaden Ivey's been disappointing. Kid Cunningham's right. been up and down for them. Right. So they're just like this guy. Just keep giving. Like he's just here. Like let him do yeah. stuff. Right. Um, it's like the, when a rookie puts up a lot of points. It's, he's exactly. just doing it on the defensive end. So we're going to see that happen with Scoot Henderson for the rest of the year. Now that he's healthy, yes. that's going to happen in Portland probably, yes. especially if they make moves by the trade deadline. With Jaime, the fact that he has to do it within this structure, with a yes. team with actual title aspirations and playoff contention hopes, with a well-structured hierarchy and players that are far above them, they're not just putting him out there as a top draft pick and say, go to work, do what right. you do. I think that's much more impressive. I, mean, I think you can make that same argument for Chet as well. But so exactly. I, I think exactly. by the Those, end of the yeah. year, I think Jaime might be able to surpass Webb and Yama just because if not the necess- if not because of the production, but the fact that mm-hmm. he does what he does and he's so gifted at so many different aspects of the game that he does it within I, this confine, the context of this team. I think he might wind up being I, the I, second best rookie. I would be surprised if that happened just because no doubt. Yama's only going to keep getting better sure. and what he's already been able to do. And, and what you've seen, like the learning curve for him, he's already better a month into the season than he was the first night. So I don't know. But just the fact that he's in this conversation with maybe two of the best rookies that we've had over the last decade in Chet and Wembenyama, he's not really in that conversation. I would put them squarely in their own tier. But the fact that Jaime Jaquez is sort of leading the pack or in amongst the leading group of that next tier says a lot about the guy that was taken 18th overall, which is something that I want to talk about in a little oh, bit. Yeah. But just to sort of underscore what it is that J.J. Redick was talking about there and for – the, our listeners who, okay, they, they see the stats and you get caught up in all the stats and stuff. Here's the thing that really impresses me about Jaime Jaquez here. Uh, and we talked about all the responsibilities and all that stuff. There's so many nuances to the game, right? And I don't expect everybody to understand that stuff. You and I only understand like the surface level of this stuff compared to what these, sure. these elite basketball players do. 
But a rookie very rarely is able to anticipate what's going to happen. And that's the thing that always stands out to me with Jaime is his ability to anticipate the next thing that's going to happen. His cuts, his ability to take up space on the court, uh, his ability to also know like, uh, all right, if I cut here, the defense is going to rotate this way. And yes. I'm either going to be able to get to the basket over here or um, this my teammate over there is going to be open. And he always almost always makes the right decision whether or not he needs to go and score himself or pass. It's that elite understanding of the game. It's a basketball IQ thing, but I think it's an instinctual yes. thing too. And I and and it's his anticipation of what's about to happen and not yeah. what's just in front of him that stands out uh, among rookies, not just in this class, uh, but I think in, in, in among rookies that we've seen recently. Let's just, uh, but let's put a pin in it here. All right. <laughs> We're going to break. Um, does Jaime's emergence change the heat ceiling. There might be some truth to that. We'll tell you why after this. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to the next big event you want to go to because Game Time is the fast and easiest way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy shows, theater, whatever you want to go to. Game Time's got you covered with killer last-minute deals, all in prices, and I love this, the views from your seat so you can see exactly where your tickets are going to be. Make sure there's no obstructions. Make sure you get the view you want. I've been to concerts where you kind of have to move around. You're not really you know, sure of whether or not you're going to get a good, a good view of the stage. You don't want that. Game Time's got you covered with their app. It's so great to use. A couple taps, you get the tickets you want. Last-minute tickets, flash deals. So easy to find the best prices because they've got those prices, and you never have to worry about whether or not – you're getting the wrong price for the right ticket or anything like that. You know exactly what you're going to get. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets. That's what Game Time's all about. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NBA. You get twenty bucks off your first purchase. Now, terms do apply. But create an account and redeem the code L O C K E D O N N B A. That's Locked On NBA, and you get twenty dollars off. To download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thanks for making Locked on Heat your first listen every day. Make sure you are subscribed on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. Thanks to everybody who shared their Spotify wrapped with us today. If you have Locked on Heat as one of your top podcasts, please let us know and share a screenshot with us on Twitter or on Instagram. Yeah. We would love to connect with you and celebrate that. with you. Um, we've got a fun segment later on where we wrap our hottest takes of 2023. Looking forward to that. <laughs> Uh, David, before we get to uh, how this changes the heat ceiling, uh, talking again about Jaime Jaquez and his emergence as a key rotation yeah. piece for this team, you were about to say something before we went to break there. No, I, I just I love the, the the call out there about the the anticipation, the high IQ, and I think that's an oversimplification. But you know, it kind of reminds me, and I I don't like the comparison. You know, it's not apples to apples, obviously. But one of the things that I don't think enough people understand or appreciate about LeBron James is that kind of court vision, the anticipation. Everybody talks about his incredible, you know, almost like, a, you know, his memory for when a play right. is going to break down or seeing things on the court, the anticipation. And, yeah, he's he, he's a savant at that. That's that's on, you know, you can't even touch that. But I like the fact that I, I am, it really just does seem to kind of see maybe a step or two ahead. And I think the problem early on was that he was just moving at a different speed. And, and that, that happens for rookies. Like wow. you kind of have to understand, like he said it recently, like for his rookie, as a rookie, you're kind of told as your whole life, you got to speed up, you got to attack, attack, push. Mm. But, but sometimes when you enter the NBA, it's more about slowing down and understanding game time speed. And I think that was the problem early on when he was just carving out minutes and then, you know, he figured it out. He figured out how to see and how to work. I kind of get in sync with the other players and around him or a great spot for him for that yes. exact reason. Right. And you yes. mentioned, you know, early it wasn't bad, but you compare what to that, to what he's done recently over his last five games, 17.6 yeah. points per game on almost just below 13 shot attempts per game. He's shooting 56% overall. He's shooting 55.6% from three. That's a small sample. I don't even care about that. Like that's a hot shooting streak. Congrats. He's shooting 40% now from three point range for the season. That's a larger Man. sample. He shot 32%, just a hair over 32% in college. And that was the weak spot coming out of yep. UCLA. Um, he, uh, 3.8 assists, 5 rebounds, 1.2 steals per game. This guy is a good rotation player in the NBA, okay. not just okay. a good rotation player for a rookie. And I think that's important to, to point out here. Um, I, I think 
when we talk about the anticipation and the IQ and stuff, people, oh, well, this is why you draft four-year players. No, that's doing no. Jaime a disservice. Not all four-year college players are like this. I don't think every team should just go out and be like, did you go to college for four years? No, because a lot of times the college players that went there for four years weren't good enough to go to the draft. That's More often than not, that's the case. In Jaime's situation, maybe he was a late bloomer or whatever. I think his athleticism is a quiet one. Yes. Uh, yes. I think that's part of it too. But for whatever reason, man, the Heat knocked it out of the park here uh, at number 18. I, I got one more was, thing. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I was re-watching like UCLA highlights, you know, and it's like, it's so similar. Like he's doing the it's same there. things. You see it. But it's just not the potential. Like I think that's that's why I hate the goddamn draft so much. It's because you're like kind of banking on what they can potentially do versus like seeing with your eyes what he actually does. It's right. the same thing, but it just is not explosive dunking over people. It's just not pulling down 18 well, rebounds, you know. People it, get it, obsessed it, with are you six eight? Do you have this vertical? Can you run this for right. and all that stuff? And the thing I always right. say, David, is the thing that I care about and the thing that I think creates a higher ceiling, how many six, seven guys who are 230 pounds and play both forward spots have we seen come into the draft and be like, is this that guy, the next Paul George right. and then right. flame out. Right. How yep. many, like we've seen a million of these guys yep. to me, ceiling isn't size. It's not wingspan necessarily. That stuff obviously matters clearly, but I want a guy with basketball feel high level feel for the game. And Jaime clearly has that. It's the same thing I like about Tyler hero, by the yep. way, the Heat now, as of Wednesday afternoon, seventh place in the Eastern Conference, but they're four games out of first place and a bunched up top of the conference yes. uh, in terms of standings here. So they're right there in the mix. Uh, I think it's very clear now. You listen to guys like J.J. Redick and other people. I don't think anybody was ever counting the Heat out necessarily, like in right. terms of like play. But, but you know, it was Boston. I, I think based on what we've seen, Boston is still the clear number one in the East. But after that, you know, Milwaukee, Miami, Philadelphia, like well, the, Indiana. There was the like, offseason. Go ahead. There was the offseason talk about Gabe Vincent and Max, and, you know, how does the Heat recover from that? You know, I mean, he's a big leap. From talk <laughs> right. But nobody saw that, right? I mean, right. he was a, a, a middling draft pick. So, you know, I, I can understand that idea that Miami might not be a, a powerhouse contender compared to, you know, Dame Lillard and the Milwaukee Bucks or Drew Holiday but and an now, already good Boston Celtics team. Do you think, based on what we've seen from the other teams, as well as Miami, the other teams in the Eastern Conference, does the Jaime Hawkes development here specifically change the way that you think about the Heat and their ceiling in the Eastern Conference? Absolutely. I think they're a legitimate contender because I've said this for, I think, the entirety of the season, maybe even going into the season, that one of Miami's greatest strengths might be what be is able to push them beyond the Bostons and the Philadelphias and the Milwaukees is their depth. They're going to find ways to keep coming at you and attacking you, a death by a thousand cuts, right? And that's what Miami is all about. Great Maybe Taylor they Swift don't song. have – I'm sorry? It's a great Taylor Swift song. How the hell would I know that? Come I'm on. I'm just telling I, you. I, I'm letting you – I'm I, informing you as well as our audience. I think it's an expression that came around long before Taylor Swift was mm. a gleam in her dad's eye. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I, I'm sure Debatable. she did not come up with it. <laughs> on the seventh day, God created Taylor Swift. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, they don't have, we've talked about this. They they, they don't have the Dame Liver who might be able to deliver that killing blow or that guy who could potentially go off for 50 points. And they're just leaning into that. This is who Miami is. We're going to find somebody who finds a way to step up on those m moments when it matters most, whether it's Jimmy or Bam or Tyler. And I still think that's a potential there. We yep. saw Duncan have his moments in the playoffs. Yep. Awood Highsmith now emerging. If you've got all this depth here, you, one of these guys is going to find a way to step up at any given moment. And I think that's what Max and Gabe did last year during their great finals run. And everybody kind of said, oh, these are great players. Well, they had a, they lived up beyond their potential, and they fit an excellent role here in Miami that Miami had carved out for them. And I think that's where Jaime kind of is on the same track. And you got Josh Richardson yeah. kind of continuing to develop, et cetera. And, and I think it's the Hakas piece specifically that yes. I think sets Miami apart. As much as we love Haywood Highsmith, and he's probably the third best <laughs> defender on the team right now, and I'm not trying to take anything away from him. Um, Duncan Robinson's evolution has been is maybe as big a factor, if not bigger, than the Jaime Hakas thing. But yeah. The fact that they have somebody coming off the bench that can hmm. do the things that Jaime does playing on the ball. He was bringing the ball up. There was moments last night um, against Milwaukee where Kyle uh, Lowry and Josh Richardson yep. off the court. They gave it to Jaime to just bring the ball up the floor. He wasn't necessarily initiating offense. It was a lot of sort of pistol actions or just hit a heads right to Bam. But it's the really pace. The of the offense. Yeah. But just, uh, hey, rookie, bring the ball up against the Milwaukee Bucks. And Giannis, by the way, is standing on the other side of the court from you. That's that's meaningful. Uh, at least. So 
Um, the so. fact that they have him that could play on the ball, off the ball, defend uh, credibly, basically across two or three different positions now, um, like that, he's so dynamic. Where I think the guys like Haywood Highsmith and Josh Richardson are good at what they do, but I would not qualify them as dynamic. I don't think that that's what they do. They're not versatile players. I think you know, like Highsmith mm-hmm. has two jobs: hit corner threes and defend his butt off. That that's what he does. Josh Richardson is very similar: defend twos and threes and hit open shots. Like they're not versatile players the way that Jaime Jaquez is. And I think having that guy coming off your bench is huge. And that's the thing that like, you look at what Christian Brown was able to do for Denver as a sort of a surprise rookie. And yeah. in the finals, he played a big role. Like, I think it would not be shocking to me if Hawkes in the playoffs had like a series like wow. Brown did, or uh, like even Caleb Martin did in the Eastern conference finals. I think that kind of thing is in his wheelhouse, but um, okay. let's, let's move on. Can Jaime hook, I can Jaime Hawkes jr. Win rookie of the year. Plus where does he stack up? with previous draft picks that were taken at his spot. We'll talk about all of that next. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The weather's getting colder, but the offers are staying hot, especially when it comes to the NFL over at FanDuel. And right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get on the action, especially with the NFL playoff picture shaping up, the NBA season in full swing. This app is for you, and it's so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options from spreads to player props, over-unders, and so much more. Go visit the FanDuel. tournament. Uh, yes. I up at FanDuel. I like the, the Pacers at plus Suns 1,400. Suns and Pacers. Yeah, that's Suns and pick. Pacers. That, that's your pick. I can't believe it. I like what, the what, odds what at your, plus 1,400. What does your dog have to say about it? Apparently, very, very, very vocal. Excited. About... Lucy is very excited. I'm going to Okay. Well, I replace a money line bet. You know, there's no limitations there. It doesn't say humans only. I think I should, I'm sure she can win something. It's so easy to use. That's what it, it can do at FanDuel. Go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. Thanks for making Locked on Heat your first listen every day. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. All right. Before we get to the Rookie of the Year uh, discussion here, I pulled up number 18 picks <laughs> over the last 10 years in the NBA draft. Just to give – because I don't think – I think it's the best way to kind of compare – or, or measure how good a draft pick is. It's relative to the other selections, not the players that came after that player. That's fair that enough. Player. So here we go. Obviously, Jaime Hawkes in 2023. 20, uh, Chicago's Dalen Terry in 2022. I kind of liked him coming out of Arizona. We did a blue notebook on him. Very much. Has yeah, impact the rotation in Chicago, and that's says that's a Chicago. lot. I mean, that, there it is. Yep. Yeah, that, that's the that's the argument. Um, 2021 Trey Man, fine, kind of third guard yeah. but not really in the rotation for oklahoma city i think jaime hawkins is better than him josh green mavericks oh. 2020 that was a good pick he's been good he's been good yeah. uh 2019 goga patazde now just sort of finding his footing in the league with orlando but it was rough there for a few years very yeah 2018 the lonnie, rotation. Walker, lonnie the walker yeah. the fourth solid okay. but i think jaime is already going to be better than lonnie walker he's fine it's not a bad pick hmm. Jaime is better TJ Leaf in 2017 out of the league. Henry Ellenson Ooh. 2016 out of the league. Sam Decker in Ooh. 2015 out of the league. Ooh. Tyler Ennis, our old friend in 2014 out of the league. Ooh. University of Miami's own Shane Larkin in 2013, obviously. Out of ah. the league. Although I was always, I thought he should have gotten a better chance, but whatever. Undersized. Um, yeah. He was too undersized. Um, so that's the company that we're talking about with Jaime Hakez. It's not great in 10 years, but that speaks to what it is that Jaime Hakez is doing here, outperforming. What he's doing as an 18th overall pick is rare. Like, you don't find players like that at 18, in other words. And that's what the Heat have found. So I think it's partly him. It's a good fit. It's all these things. I I keep thinking, as we were watching that game yesterday, you know, maybe there's still that possibility that he's not on the scouting reports. But I I think, and, and we keep bringing up this point, the fact that he just does stuff, the fact that he has such a varied skill set. Like, what is it you're going to contain? Like, I remember when Max was having his emergence, and we saw this with Duncan. You know, like, they're, they're shooters, or they're recognized as shooters. And I think you, it's easy to kind of say, okay, he's got the ball. He's going to he's, – when he's out on the perimeter, you know what he's going to do. He's going to let it fly. But with Jaime, like, he smoked a couple of defenders. I, I don't recall if he did it against the Bucks, but, like, that spin move that he was making in UCLA, I, I think is going to be part of his arsenal. I know yep. Josh Richardson said it in the locker room yesterday – 
Jimmy, baby Jimmy out there. I think that's fair enough. Like, what are you going to do? At some point, Jaime is going to be recognized around the league, and I think he's going to get that kind of – I mean, from referees, I'm saying, and he's going to start getting whistles in his favor. So if he can continue hitting his shots, he's got a floater. He's got a nice mid-range game. He's got the spin move. He's got enough speed to be able to provide some transition basketball opportunities there. And he plays and I he gets downhill. Like he runs with force. He yeah. might not be the fastest guy. Like he won't be, he's not as right. fast as Osar Thompson, right? But he no. he gets downhill. He plays with so much force. And and you don't really want to get in front of him. Um, I, I see I don't know if it's a lack of scattering report necessarily. I don't think it's a lack of homework. I just think it's a lack of film. Like, what is this guy? Like, we don't really know. Do you you kind of want to leave him open because you don't want him getting downhill? But he's also shooting 55% from three over the last 10 games. And that's going to go up and down like it does for every, every player. Yeah. But he just has things, to your point, David, in his arsenal that he could just get to. When that three-point shot isn't falling, there's just things that we know that he can get to. The post game, the facilitating. Like when this, when when X isn't working, y, he can go to Y and Z and impact the game in that way. And I think yes. that we're talking about a rookie here. It's crazy. Um, it all right. Speaking of the rookies, Kia rookie ladder, according to NBA, they do this, what, once a week, every couple weeks? I'm not yep. really sure. Um, they've got Chet Holmgren at number one. This is NBA.com's, uh, what's his name? Steve Ashburner. Right. He's got Chet number one, Victor Wendemey now number two. No debate here so far. This is where it gets a little sticky. Jordan Hawkins, Pelicans, number three. Asar Thompson, number four. Brandon Miller of Charlotte, number five. And he's got Jaime at number six. I think that this is wildly uh, wrong. I think that Jaime is easily top five. I put him over Brandon Miller, who has been in and out of the rotation because of injuries. Like Jaime Hawkes has played every game for the Heat this year. He's the only Heat player to have done that. Um, I we are look, look what he says. Time. Look what Steve says about it. Too. Had 14 points, four rebounds, and six assists in 33 minutes in Lillard game. Consistent off Heat bench. Like that's it. That's all he's he, he he's not watching the games, and that's absolutely fine. I know it's impossible to watch every game and every minute of all these rookies, even if that's just your only job, which it's not. Oh. So I understand it, but he's seen the most recent game and goes, "Oh, this guy's pretty good. I should probably be talking about him." Maybe you do a little bit of research there to kind of figure out what his impact is. He's like consistent. I don't want to. I don't yeah, want to go in on. I don't want to go in on on one writer though. Like I, I no, I right. Get no, it. you're right. Like people are going to start paying attention now, and they're going to be noticing, and maybe guys like Steve will, will watch a few more of these games, and that's fine. Like, I think having Hawkins this high is a little bit of just also not watching the Pelicans and just seeing the stats. Like, I think Hawkins has been fine. I don't think he's right. been nearly as good as Jaime. It's, but wh wh whether we're talking about just, like, qualitatively who's better or rookie of the year odds, I don't think Hawkins is going to be in the rookie of the year conversation. Having him at number three is a little insane to me. He's been fine. I just – three is a little high. Um, rookie of the year. Does Jaime have any shot? Can I go first? I'm going to just say no. He's got no shot. I think it's Chet and it's Wembenyama. And that's it. That has nothing to do, again, that's not a qualitative argument. This is back to what we were talking about at the start of the show, David. It's a little bit more narrative. It's all this stuff. It's a, it's a Chet and Wemby race right now. And I think it's fine. I think they've been two of the, the best rookies far and away. And if it's those two, I'm okay with it. I don't need Jaime to win Rookie of the Year here. But I think it's going to be one of those two guys. I don't think Jaime has a shot here unless one of those guys. Get, I agree. Like, both I, of them get injured or something. I think the, the only path to that is, you know, a, a severe injury to a starter, probably even Jimmy Butler, which we don't want to consider, and him emerging, uh, emerging as like a, a go-to scorer in that starting lineup. I mean, I just I don't see that path happening for Jaime. So uh, to be, no, I agree with you 100%. I just don't think there's a chance for him. But I don't care. Has, I, I like He has gone up. Uh, FanDuel's Rookie of the Year odds. Chet, number one now. Min minus 145. Victor Wembanyama minus 110. That's interesting. Asar Thompson at plus 10,000. So he's third. So it, it, when I say it's a Chet and Wemby race, it is a Chet and Wemby race. Asar Thompson's third at plus 10,000. Jaime Hakez Jr. plus 12,000. So hmm. um, I think putting him on any of those would be a little silly because I do think it's Chet and Victor and you'd just be throwing $5 away. But I, he's he's at least fourth now and he wasn't to start the season. So that says a lot. All right. Okay, a lot of buzz. We mentioned Spotify wrapped earlier in the show. So we thought uh, with everybody sharing uh, the podcast and the music that they listen to the most over the year of 2023, we could share our locked on heat hot takes wrapped or the hot takes that we've said the most basically over the last year. Yeah, so David, so you and I came up with a few of our top takes. These are volume shooting metrics here. Uh, not necessarily the best takes, just the ones we said the most. Uh, right. Why don't you start? All right, uh, and, and first of all, echoing what you said earlier, I love that people share those with us. When when I think Spotify introduced this a few years ago, 
and it became a thing that everybody wanted to share on, on social media. You weren't with the podcast at that point in time. And it just, I, I was just so happy to get that kind of positive feedback and reception for people saying, you know what, we tune into your show as often as you do. And we know, like you and I, even I don't listen to as many podcasts as I want to. You get a life, you've got a job, you've got a lot to do. You can't always tune into all those shows. But the fact that people say they spent thousands of minutes listening to you and I talk about the Miami Heat basketball, and I know they had an impressive run and everything else like that, but at the same time, I, I just, I, I'm so happy to get that kind of feedback. So please, if you do, if we do pop up on your rap list, please send it over because we love yeah. hearing from you. But anyway, in terms of my reasons off, in 2023 of why I do the show, number one is the money. And number two is all the, the people that listen to it like that is <laughs> no, seriously, it makes it, it does no, make I it worth it. it. It does make it worth Absolutely. it. So I'm one with you. very heartwarming, but let's do the takes. All right, number right. one, number, oh, number five, the, number five. I'm sorry at the bottom. Yeah, right, number five. Go. Yeah. Right. Number five. What is talent? <laughs> What is talent? It's it's a great one that you come up with a lot. It's it's basically a counter to my number five here, which is the Heat need more talent. I think I over that over much of last year when the Heat were basically hovering at five hundred and it looked like all hope was lost and that they might have to trade Jimmy Butler in the summer and all this stuff. And I was and that, that the Jimmy Butler do they have to trade him? That take didn't make my wraps, but it was it was on the bubble. Um, I kept saying the Heat just need more talent. They're not as talented as these other teams. And you're like, what is talent? Is Haywood Highsmith not as talented as Victor Webinyama? And I would say, no, he's not. Uh, and so that was uh, those were some of the those were some of the highlights. I'd still rather year. have Max Struess or Zion Williamson on this roster. But anyway, my right, number four take: the draft slash championships don't matter. <laughs> I don't know what we play for here. They don't matter. They don't matter. Just go out and have fun. Basketball poetry, baby. That's what it's all about. <laughs> I guess. Uh, Again, and you said this before we started recording, the only reason you ever say that championships don't matter is when I say championships do matter. Um, I think championships do matter. I don't know that they matter as much for this oh. Heat team. I, I think if this Heat team's legacy, and I've said this before, if the legacy of this Heat team is just gave the rest of the NBA hell for <laughs> five years, yeah, and Jimmy Butler never got the ring, but boy, did he create a legacy... I think that's okay if that's this team's legacy, the Jimmy Butler version of this team, and then whatever happens after happens after. I think Bam's going to need to have a ring. But next. Speaking of Bam, my number three take. Bam, Defensive Player of the Year. We have this together. This is on both of our lists. Absolutely. You and I have been <laughs> slamming the Bam out of bio should be winning Defensive Player of the Year button all year. Absolutely. Uh, my number two take. Tyler might not be good enough. <laughs> I don't like it. I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that one. Yeah, I, I don't, listen, this is what I'm known for. I, I don't know how my comments about Tyler, I'm like president of the Tyler Hero Hate Club, a Haters Club, according to some people. I don't think I've been that negative on Tyler. I mean, I was there for his rookie year, it, and everything he did in the bubble. It's the main just, difference between the David Heads and the West Heads, I think. <laughs> the David Heads are on with you. They're like, I agree with David. Bench Tyler, trade him for peanuts and all these things. I know that you're not saying that. I know that you don't say that, <laughs> but you, that. those comments yeah. are attributed to you. And the West heads are like, Tyler Hero, future Hall of Famer. Why would you ever bench him? He should be taking the most <laughs> shots on the team. He's the number one option over Jimmy and Bam. Have I ever said that? No. Are those things attributed to me? All the time. So, uh, yeah, it could be. Uh, but that was my other thing is that Tyler Hero is really good. And I've, I've been kind of known for the other side of it is like the Tyler Hero apologist. All right. You're, you're number one. My number one take for this season, the Heat are good enough. They just are. And it, and it, it's it's your take this year, and it, that's why it's number one, but it was also your take your last year, even though they stunk right. all season long. You're like, they can win the championship. And I was like, you are crazy. This team has no finals run in it. You've never seen this before. It's never going to happen. And then what happened? They made the finals run, and they got a game on the Denver Nuggets. And that's why my number one uh, Spotify rap take was that the Heat stink. I kept saying it. I was wrong. Again, this was not a quality argument. This was just a volume shooting metric. I kept telling you the Heat stunk last year. I still stand by it. They did stink in the regular season. Uh, they surprised everybody. It was a, a historic yeah. run for a reason. You can't be surprised and then also be like, well, this run was coming all along. Uh, those two things don't go together. But uh, you were the only one that believed it uh, in the first place. So congratulations to you. Thanks for making Lockdown Heat your first listen every day. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Follow us on your favorite podcast app. Share your Spotify rap with us on Twitter and on Instagram. We would love to celebrate the end of the year in that way and connect with you guys. Also, Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 
24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked on Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. So go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel.